Dr. Tabani received his PhD in statistics from Western University, and his extensive knowledge of clinical trials, evidence-based medicine, research ethics, systematic reviews, and conjoint analysis of patient preferences for health services. With that being said, we hope you enjoy our conversation with Dr. Tabani on statistics and its real-world implications. So Dr. Tabani, um, so could you maybe uh, briefly talk about the use uh, and importance of statistics and statistical testing for clinical studies? Um, so essentially just like why is this an important uh, topic for someone from the general public uh, to know? Thank you, Mara. Uh, it's, it's a very good question. Um, the field of statistics um, has a whole lot of applications. Um, in different aspects of our lives. But I'll try to focus more of uh, the use or applications of statistics in health in terms of why it's important, how we approach it, um, and how we apply it, and the reasons for which we apply it. Yeah. So typically, you know, in health, um, we are either trying to figure out how to diagnose diseases, how to treat health conditions, uh, or how to manage them if they're chronic conditions, um, uh, including really, uh, you know, issues of uh, um, how to really put in place plans, um, you know, to make sure that we can prevent diseases. And all these things really require planning. And statistics becomes one of the useful tools that we use in planning those studies and part of planning is to think about how much information should I collect to be able to actually uh, conduct a study that is aiming to prevent something and then be able to have high confidence that whatever findings I get from that study uh, are credible. So statistics really allows us to be able to determine the amount of information and part of it because we often go into any study with what I would call high hopes. Uh, in science, we call those hypotheses that if we do A and B, we can actually uh, treat this disease better than if we didn't do it, or we can actually prevent this condition than if we didn't do it, and so on, or compared to some other alternative. And so statistics allows us to be able to collect information that will help us to be able to address whether is the evidence supportive of that hypothesis or those high hopes that we have. So as you can see, statistics becomes really important, um, you know, in planning such studies and of course in how we collect the data and then how we analyze those data, including how we interpret it. One of the things that happens in life is anytime you make an effort in anything, there's always chances that you could actually see something to be working uh, by chance. And one of the values of statistics is it allows us to be able to plan this study such that we can rule out the play of chance of seeing something that appears to work while in fact it doesn't work. Or even missing that something works when it actually works because we didn't have enough information. So in general, you can think of statistics really as a way of life because um, we are always dealing with you know, conditions, the issues, how to best diagnose them. And if we did, how to best uh, treat them. And if they continue to bother us, how to best manage them, uh, including really how to best prevent them. Prevention is part of key part in health. And statistics plays a role across the spectrum. That's really interesting. I think it's even more obvious that statistical thinking is highly relevant in the age of this pandemic. We're seeing all these studies coming out and people are just making conclusions without really understanding the numbers. And it really shows that we should be able to analyze information better as the general public. That's very true. Um, in fact, um, one of the famous statisticians, uh, Tuki, uh, actually, um, George Wells once predicted that statistical thinking will someday be as uh, necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. We all know there's nothing as important for all citizens as the ability to be able to write and read, right? So as you can imagine now, the way we are approaching this uh, pandemic is really a flow of information that's coming so rapidly 
that um, and is changing so rapidly at the same time that every citizen is expected to keep up with the information and to be able to receive and consume this information in ways that prompt them to behave uh, in ways that protect themselves and protect everybody around. So it's all about using information to get people to behave in a protective manner. And that's all about statistical thinking. So statistical thinking is really how we utilize information around us in ways that can help us to make better decisions, whether it's diagnosing something, preventing it, treating it, or managing it. Uh, and now you know, with this pandemic, every citizen now really is expected to understand what it means to flatten the calf. This used to be something that we would only expect scientists to understand, but now we expect everybody in the community to understand what it means. Why doing certain things would actually help us achieve that goal of flattening the calf. We need everybody to understand what it means to ban the cat. Uh, so also we need everybody to understand why it's important to wear a mask. And there's all sorts of information and pictures trying to show people what happens when you wear a mask in terms of how it protects you and how it protects other people around you. This is all the information. And you're thinking about cause and effect and you expect every citizen to understand what happens when you wear a mask and what effect does it have on you and the people around you and so on. This is all about statistical thinking when you think about it. And everybody in a community or in a society is now expected to consume information in ways that prompt them to behave um, such that they can protect themselves and protect the people around them. Absolutely. It's directly correlated to people's lives uh, in this pandemic. And I wouldn't be surprised if statistical, a statistical course becomes a requirement for any high school graduate even in the future based on this pandemic. Well, it's possible. Um, the world is evolving uh, in ways that have we never thought would be possible before. So I, I think, you know, statistical thinking is perhaps a paramount uh, aspect of societal survival that you don't need to be a statistician to be able to consume information in ways that's constructive um, and I think every citizen really now living in the information era uh, need to be able to consume information in ways that's helpful and uh, be able to be critical about the information Part of statistical thinking is allows you to be able to gain the skill and the insights of how to be critical when you see information. And we see now that everyone uh, is consuming COVID information about treatment vaccines in ways that allows them to be critical uh, about what's correct, what's wrong, uh, and um, what things could be misleading, what things may not be misleading, um, who to believe and who not to believe. So on because there's with every good information that comes out of there uh, out there there's also misinformation um, uh, that come through fake news and so on but um, a society that adopts statistical thinking in their approach to life helps them to be able to then discern good information from bad information absolutely actually on that topic we had a question to ask so what advice do you have? to give our viewers that are actually watching this video right now about consuming science in the media, especially those reported by, you know, popular news outlets such as CNN, MSNBC and whatnot, in regards to statistical significance. Give me one second. I'm, I'm, I'm taking some. Don't worry, Dr. Thomas, you can just edit this out. It's all yeah, good. you can edit that out, okay? All right. Absolutely. You if you don't mind, I'm going to repeat my question. Yes. Absolutely. Perfect. So, so on that topic, what advice do you have to give our viewers that are watching this video right now about consuming science in popular media such as CNN, MSNBC, about statistical significance and statistical thinking, especially in the context of vaccines and the current pandemic? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a very good question. Um, you know, part of, uh, well, let me start by the good things first. 
Um, the good thing is, you know, this pandemic has really put to light the value of science to society. Something that we should all celebrate because most of the science that really takes place is supported through public funds. And it's always good for the public to now get the value out of uh, all the efforts of supporting science. And now we see everybody is paying attention to science, um, including the press who really uh, provide a forum or a platform uh, to be able to share scientific findings with the lay audience or the public. So that's a good thing uh, that science is now uh, front stage. The challenge that comes with um, uh, connect, uh, reporting of scientific information through the, the lay press is there's always a potential for misinformation with all the best of intentions um, because not all reporters are scientists. And in science, we often worry about the loose um, use of words like, you know, significant findings, statistical significance, uh, clinical significance, and so on, because the the two concepts of statistical significance and clinical significance don't mean the same thing. They're different, right? Quite often, the unfortunate reality of how science is uh, practiced or even reported is that quite people tend to emphasize statistical significance more than clinical significance. If any study is found to have a statistically significant finding, um, that tends to actually hide the media uh, interest in it and the hype and attention uh, in the press. Um, and to be honest, it, it, it's, it, it has the potential to actually uh, you know, get people to focus on statistical significance. While if you look closely, you may actually find that uh, there's lots of other things that have perhaps not gotten attention uh, about the study. Some of which may include the fact that maybe the, while the finding is uh, statistically significant, it's not clinically important. Um, quite often studies that are very large, and if you look at all the vaccine trials, they're quite very large and we expect them to be large, right? And the issues of statistical significance when you're comparing between uh, vaccine and something else, it, it's, or even treatments, it's very highly plausible. Uh, but the finding may not be uh, clinically relevant, right? Same thing, you could actually find situations where the studies are not that large, um, but by chance, just by chance, they actually get a, a finding that is statistically significant and this just occurred by chance, it doesn't really mean much uh, in life. Um, so, you know, how do we counter out this? Is first, you know, you know, getting, making sure that um, our media and press people are highly educated about issues of um, science, you know, the difference between statistical significance and clinical significance. And also in some ways, we need to educate the public about this issue so that they can understand and see when a reporter is perhaps uh, emphasizing one over the other inappropriately. Right? Now, I hope I'm not coming across as saying that people make these mistakes all the time. And, you know, uh, some people are educated. They try to actually portray information in a way that's uh, really accurate. But quite often, uh, many of the reports are actually uh, putting more emphasis on significant, statistically significant findings than they do on clinically relevant findings. We know for sure that um, in science, the prevalence of uh, findings that are not statistically significant, but are highly clinically relevant, is very high. So just because something was not statistically significant, it doesn't mean the finding itself uh, may not be of any use to the public. But those are the ones that don't often get a lot of attention in the media. So we need to be careful every time we hear something about the media because for what we hear, there's a lot more that we don't hear about, which may still be very useful to society, but they didn't get statistical significance to be able to actually attract media attention. 
Uh, yeah, so thank you for talking about that. Um, so kind of along what you were already mentioning, um, so you talked about um, the differences or like why we should focus more on um, clinical significance versus statistical significance. So why do you think that's especially important in today's state of uncertainty and distrust in science and public health from the perspective of the general public? Like why is it more important um, to focus on clinical significance versus statistical significance with the trajectory of where the public's trust in the science um, and public health is kind of headed towards. All right. So first let's bear in mind that um, the relationship between scientists and the public is based on nothing else but trust. Right? So whether things happen intentionally or unintentionally, anything that happens that later on may actually uh, tamper that trust could actually ruin that relationship. And of course, lead to uh, an unfortunate mistrust between um, the scientists and the public, and of course, the public and science. So I think it's important uh, for us uh, to really um, pay attention and be on the lookout to make sure that how information about science is communicated is accurate so that we don't get to a situation where we now have to come back later on to intervene and try to correct those things because this could lead to mistrust of science. Right? Now, um, many of uh, the studies that are done for COVID, they're done very rapidly, um, which, um, Yes, you know, the house is on fire. You're trying to figure out how to put out the fire as quickly as you can. But there's always a risk that by doing so, we may actually, you know, take shortcuts where we shouldn't be taking shortcuts, um, including not being careful enough how we now relay the information to the public once uh, we've um, achieved, uh, finished studies and so on. That's where the danger is um, with the way we are approaching this pandemic. I th I'm sure you've all seen situations where um, public decisions were made, but there was either no evidence, little evidence, or the evidence was there, but it was of poor quality. But the public didn't know at the time, nor were they even told at the time that this was the state. Two or three months later, we reverse the same decision, but now we're saying, oh, now we know better um, um, because there's evidence showing this. Now, the question is, why didn't we say at that time earlier on that when we made this decision earlier on, we didn't have the evidence? At least say it at that time that we don't have the evidence, but here's what we think and here's why we think, despite not having the evidence. And once we have the evidence, we'll come back and revisit this issue. That's how you really build trust. If you make a decision in the absence of evidence, say so, right? If you make decisions in the presence of weak evidence, also say so. If you make evidence in the absence of uh, poor quality, lots of evidence, then say so. That continues to build a trust that, hey, we're human. We live uh, in a world where you know things are changing rapidly. The issues about this pandemic are changing so rapidly, and part of it is because there's lots of information and evidence coming very on a daily basis. Some good, some bad. And unfortunately, the majority of it bad because it's done so rapidly and you know, shortcutting some of the things we've put in place uh, to safeguard you know, ourselves from errors and so on. I mean, a very typical example is we have uh, studies uh, about treatments or even vaccines that are actually published uh, and relate to the public before they undergo peer review system. We have always relied on peer review as a safeguard uh, to you know, assess the, uh, the rigor and the accuracy of the methods that are used in science before we can actually then make them public and so on. But since the pandemic began, many of the things about COVID go directly from the bench to the public without having gone through peer review system. And you're bad. Two or three months later, we're back again, correcting that same mistake, uh, information. So that's part of the challenges we're facing. And, um, you know, the issue is, there's lots of stakeholders that have vested interest in 
finding the solutions, but some also have vested interest in other things that are not helpful, like the glory coming to the institutions and their scientists and, and the fame and so on, uh, being the first ones to come, to come up with a solution. Um, so uh, people who could help also have conflict of interest. And we need to be vigilant uh, to all this. I hope I'm not coming across as seeing that institutions and people act in self-interest all the time. But it is a reality that these things do happen, whether they're intentional or unintentional. Uh, and being vigilant is the only way we can actually help ourselves to be able to make sure that evidence uh, for or against anything is often scrutinized properly. Um, you know, keeping in mind the potential abuses and misuses of this information, particularly when it comes to things that are significant. I keep saying significant because that's a catch word for all people um, talking about science. So you could even say that it's kind of like a fine balance between trying to get the published work out um, so that scientists can collaborate. Like with the uh, pandemic, we've seen people pushing out more papers quickly, but then you also kind of lose the peer review process, like you mentioned. Um, so, so like you mentioned, like I think vigilance is important on scientists end and on the public's end. Um, Armin, are you going to add on to that? Yeah, I think the, some, one interesting example that came to my mind was a paper that came early on in the pandemic from France. And Dr. Thibani, the sample size of the, pa- the study was four. And they pretty much concluded from that the combination of hydroxychloroquine with amoxicillin is a perfect treatment for COVID-19. And obviously that made all the headlines. But, you know, four people, of course, there could be random variation between them. So again, it was just this, they wanted to get the paper out quickly without actually looking for the quality of the paper. So I think your point is absolutely really valid and important these days. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And, you know, there's certain things that this pandemic has uh, made possible in a good way, but it also uh, made them possible in a bad way. I'll give you a very good example. Um, we've all understood the importance of sharing information as a way to help each other to be able to find solutions to the problem. And one of the things that has become, uh, you know, possible as a result of this pandemic is what we call preprints. That submission of any manuscript that is COVID related uh, in a preprint platform for everybody to see. It's free. Now, it's a good thing. Why? Because it's making transparent everything that is being studied about the virus. That means it's possible that even the media and the lay people would actually get their hands on this thing and talk about it before it actually goes through a peer review system, right? Which is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But It can be dangerous if we find out later on that, oh boy, there's lots of problems with that once it goes through peer review system. Uh, So that's why really being vigilant helps. Um, We want transparency, of course, and preprints provide that transparency in reporting and so on, but it also becomes dangerous when people who don't understand science and the rigor of science or the importance of rigor in science and the methods are also now consuming that information in ways that they're using it to make decisions, uh, which um, you know could be problematic if it turns out the methods were actually not helpful. We have had quite a number of papers dealing with COVID retracted from journals. I'm not even talking about the ones that actually um, you know, we seem to have, you know, small errors here and there, problems, and had to be flagged and so on. But the rate of retraction um, for this, uh, for of the evidence or papers uh, in journals, is actually matching the rate of information coming out dealing with COVID. So, which is not surprising. For sure, for sure. I think um, you're absolutely right. The preprint is a is a double-edged sword. It's, it has its benefit. It has its issues as well. Uh, do you think we should maybe provide more statistical education for journalists that cover science? 
because I feel like they bridge the, the gap between the general public and these preprints and all these studies. The short answer is yes, but I, I would say we don't only need to educate the, the press, I would say we need to educate the scientists of how to talk to the public. Because wouldn't it be nice to actually have people who really understand science, but learn the skills of communicating science in ways that the public can understand? Because they are more likely to get it right than we would try to teach, you know, the the press uh, how to communicate science when they're not scientists uh, to do the same. So that would be one thing. The other thing is, I think it's good to actually educate the public about critical thinking and statistical thinking itself um, so that they can be better consumers of information, whether it's coming from uh, the scientists themselves or uh, the press because you don't really need to be a scientist to be able to actually ask questions about, all right, um, what was what was the question of this study? Uh, who are the people in this study? What were they trying to study and why were they trying to study that? Um, how did they get people in? Um, is the finding that, uh, or the conclusion, is, does it really, is it still related to the question they were asking? Some of the things, you know, you can clearly see that the emphasis on the finding doesn't seem to relate directly to the question that is being asked. Because quite often, if people don't find statistical significance on the primary focus of the study, guess what? They focus on the secondary aspects of it. Every study always has more than one question. But if you are a smart lay audience, you can actually say, hang on a minute. I thought the primary focus was about this. But now they're saying the most important finding in this study is this one. Uh, so clearly it means the study was negative on the primary focus, but they're not telling it, right? So, I mean, we could educate the audience to be able to ask questions. They may not have the answers themselves, but they will be educated enough to be able to ask um, you know, some important questions that the scientist or the press would have to answer. So, I mean, there's, there's lots of people, including really um, administrators in different institutions and people who actually are responsible uh, for all, providing oversight on research. Many of them um, may not necessarily understand all the intricacies of uh, how some of the scientific things actually come up and how they're communicated in the lay public. So there's, I would say everybody, we need to educate everybody, to be honest, um, about critical thinking, um, you know, how to be better citizens who can consume information better. That's statistical thinking. I think you made a really interesting point. The responsibility isn't on just one group of the population. We all need to uh, yes. really critically think about these things. Well, uh, Dr. Tabani, hopefully after this pandemic, it, it, a lot of negative things came out of it, but hopefully more statistical thinking and more critical thinking is utilized by everyone. Uh, that's the only positive thing I can say about this pandemic. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you, sir. Hopefully we can have you back for better, better videos. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion. Uh, we are all in this together and we're learning a lot as we go. Um, if anything, I think um, we we'll all have the opportunity to look back and see what lessons we can all take from these experiences. Um, there's certainly a lot of things that um, were new and you know thrown at us and we had to learn as we go. But the second thing is that we've also discovered that we have taken for granted and we need to do better. And if anything, I think the idea of teaching scientists to be better communicators with the lay audience is something that we should have done a long time ago. But if anything, this um, pandemic has really highlighted the importance of teaching scientists how to be able to talk to the lay audience. Uh, in ways that can bring them along. There's some people who are very good at it, but um, others we all need to be educated on how to do it. And certainly, uh, if anything, it has highlighted the importance of every citizen paying attention to science because we are better off as citizens and as a society when we understand what science is and what science is doing for us because we fund it. 
uh, we support it with our taxes. Um, so it's in our best interest and collective um, benefit if we actually pay attention to how it's done and certainly how it's communicated. Um, so I'm sure we will take um, stock of all the lessons we have learned and hopefully come out better, including how we actually prepare for this. Because um, if you look back, this was one of those predictable uh, episodes. Um, and yet there had been failures at all levels of our society um, to prepare to deal with it or even to prepare to deal with it once it was here. We kept making mistakes after that mistake. Uh, you know, we, we, we there's no reason why we couldn't even prepare to deal with the issues of um, the waves. We knew the waves would come based on history. And yet we kept repeating the same mistakes. We had the first wave, we didn't learn the lessons. We had the second wave, we didn't learn the lessons. And third wave, in Ontario now, we are actually uh, in the upswing of our third wave. And it's all caused by the same mistakes we made in earlier waves, which was not the first time. We had learned the lessons about how these waves will care from previous uh, pandemics. So that means we as a public are not learning from mistakes. Our scientists, uh, some of them actually keep warning us, uh, but our public health uh, officials also, we are all contributing to this. Um, citizens, we are, some of them are refusing to wear masks, right? So there's definitely lots of things that I hope this pandemic, pandemic would actually have reminded us to take seriously uh, because it takes all of us uh, to get it uh, done for sure. Thank you for um, having this conversation.